so that's me. I am, uh, so I have three different job titles, uh, which explains why I have so much less hair than I used to have when I was Matt's age. Uh, the top one means that I'm a Huntington's disease researcher. The middle one means that I'm a clinical neurologist. And the bottom one means that I do uh, HD Buzz, which has been mentioned, which is this um, outreach project where we try and explain HD science to the people who need to hear about it, which is you guys. And um, I like to talk about HD in terms of this uh, picture, which is this huge mountain with the top covered in cloud. And our job as scientists and researchers is to try and get to the top of that mountain, that being the shared aim that we all have of curing Huntington's disease. There are two problems. One is that the mountain is very big, and we know that for sure. The other is that we can't see the top of it, so we're not actually quite sure how high the mountain is or how we're going to get there. And I'm sure you would agree that uh, that creates problems for you guys because you're looking at this mountain just as we are and you want to know where the top is and how we're going to get there and when it's going to happen. Um, so personally I think that it's, a, you know, I would encourage you to think about the top of the mountain and getting there together. But equally I think you'd be considered not so smart if you were to get up on a Saturday morning and look at a mountain like this and say, well, I think I'll go to the top of that and just set off walking. You, uh, a, a journey of that kind needs to be broken down into lots of little steps. You obviously need the overall goal in your mind, but if that's all you're thinking about, then it's likely that you'll never get there because you'll fall down a crevasse on the way or be assailed by a snow wolf or something like that. I don't even know if that's a real animal. But. <laughs> There we go. So my view is that, as well as keeping that overall goal in mind, uh, I would encourage you to, to think about the steps along the way. And the good thing about steps is that it's fairly easy to go up one step. And when that happens, you know you're one step closer to the goal. And occasionally you might go down one step, but that's an awful lot better than falling down the whole mountain. So breaking things down into steps uh, is my advice to you guys for understanding HD research and understanding the journey that we share together getting to the top of the mountain. So hope is good. But I speak to a lot of people from HD families who tell me that they're sick of hearing the word hope. And some of them are sick of hearing the word cure because scientists have been bandying it around for years and all we ever seem to do is publish another study where the mice uh, got were a little better or another study where we describe what, pe what patients with HD, uh, you know, one symptom that they go through or one new emotion that they can't recognise properly, or, you know, and it's all, it all seems very abstract. Uh, so there's this kind of hope fatigue, if you see what I mean, where people are uh, sick of hearing the word hope. Uh, so I prefer the term substantive hope. And by that I mean, you know, keep the top of the mountain in mind, but hope for the little steps along the way. Get to know what those steps are familiarise yourself with this, the specifics of what we're doing as researchers and that will bring advantages. An example is, so the big hope obviously is I hope they cure HD. An example of a substantive hope is something like I hope that the forthcoming early human trials of gene silencing uh, drugs demonstrate the safety needed for larger studies. Um, and if that sounds like jargon, then don't worry, because that's one of the things that I'll be explaining, and that's one of the little steps that I'll be telling you about that you can then keep an ear out for uh, developments in. It's one of the most exciting things. So I would encourage you to have lots of these little nuggets, little pebbles of substantive hope. Um, and if you, my feeling is that if you hope for lots of little things, you'll frequently be excited, and you'll, if you're disappointed, it will only be short-lived, and it will only be a little disappointment. So HD Buzz is my uh, sort of gift to you guys and my way of uh, trying to do that in your everyday lives because uh, my colleague Jeff Carroll and I um, do a lot of t talking at meetings like this and at big HD conferences but we also want to be able to offer that sort of service in people's everyday <laughs> lives as well so that people can be involved in HD as much or as little as they want. And so this is Jeff Carroll. Uh, I'm the funny one and he's the good looking one and uh, I have better suits than him but he's, uh, <laughs> he's catching me up. <laughs> so this is us talking at uh, an HD uh, meeting, this was a World Congress on Huntington's disease and what we believe is that it is the duty of scientists like me and Jeff 
So Jeff is a scientist, but he's also from an HD-affected family, and he himself carries the HD mutation. So he's a kind of uh, pretty hard-working guy, as you can imagine. Um, we believe that it's a, that the, the traditional view that a scientific work is finished when it's published in a journal is not is no longer correct or sustainable. That it's actually the duty of scientists like me to explain the science that we do to the people who need to hear about it. And we also believe that with a bit of effort from people like us, um, all science can be explained to, uh, to people who are interested in hearing about it. This is our website, it's hdbuzz.net. You can also find our content on lots of lay organization sites, pretty much all of them, to be honest. You can follow us on Twitter, you can find us on Facebook, and we also have a YouTube channel, which is where this video will be going. Oh, man. Now, I wrote down a pronunciation. So one of our uh, sponsors, very early and loyal sponsors, is the HD uh, Ireland Association. So I need to say... Oh, man, this is going to go badly wrong. Gurov ma ugiv. Terrible, terrible. Okay, more laughter than applause. Okay, I won't, I won't try that again. I'll get you to say it next time. Um, this is what HD Buzz looks like. So we had a, a, a reboot, we relaunched uh, in... Uh, I can see people going, what the hell was that? <laughs> people, um, we relaunched in January uh, with this kind of new, uh, pretty-looking, clean uh, website with a very simple interface. This is what it looks like. So we have these featured articles, which are the kind of hot, the hottest topic. So they kind of stick at the top for longer. You can see the previously featured ones, and then the news uh, stories uh, kind of come underneath that. This is new as well, this start here box. So if it's your first time visiting HD Buzz, um, or if you're new to HD, that's where you can start to get like, an overview of HD and to really do what I'm doing today, which is set out the, in brief the more exciting things that are going on. Um, this is what an HD Buzz article looks like. So we have a brief summary here, and we uh, aim to say the whole article in the first paragraph in case people have problems with attention. <coughs> Lots of pictures. We use a thermometer icon so that people know precisely how hot this news is in terms of how, how it will help us to find treatments. You can tell us you enjoyed the article, you didn't understand it. This is new as well. You can download articles as a PDF and print them off. So you can email them to people or you can print them off for people who are too old or too scared to use the internet. So people <laughs> beyond the reach of HDO uh, can have our uh, PDFs and, and read them in their rocking chairs. Um, also things like if you have a support group uh, where if you want to um, I was very rude to old people I love old people <laughs> uh, if you have a support group um, or you meet to talk about HD at all or in, in the in the neurology clinic or the HD clinic you can print off the articles there and, and discuss them or people can take them home and read them um, you can also get our stories by email so if you don't want to visit online, you can get the every story in your inbox, or you can get these digests, weekly or monthly digests. Uh, so that's HD Buzz, and that's where I would encourage you to go to, um, to, to keep in touch with the sorts of things that I'm telling you about today. So my, the, the, the specifics that I want to talk about, I'll come on to in a mo. I'm, I've got two lots of five things to tell you. So later on I'll be talking about the five top drug targets for Huntington's disease that are most exciting. But first I want to give you my five big reasons to have hope, to have substantive hope. So the first thing I want to let you know is that, in my opinion, Huntington's disease is the most curable, incurable brain disorder. Um, some people don't like the word cure. Lots of people don't like the word incurable. And they're both there with very good reason. The reason is that um, at the moment we don't have any treatments for Huntington's disease that will slow it down. So it's incurable and that's a fact. However, um, there are lots of incurable diseases, like the common cold or the flu, um, and there are also lots of diseases for which scientists in recent years have come up with treatments that make a big difference. Multiple sclerosis is a good example. Huntington's is a neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, and those are much more common and they get a lot more money than Huntington's does. But we have one advantage, and it's a huge advantage. Uh, and it's one that the big drug companies are just kind of waking up to now, which is that everyone with Huntington's disease has the same basic genetic mutation. And everyone with that mutation will get Huntington's at some point, unless we can cure it or fix it. 
That's not true of Alzheimer's, it's not true of Parkinson's, it's not true of motor neuron disease. In fact, it's only a tiny number of people with those diseases who have a known genetic mutation. And that means that, well, what, let me tell you what's actually happened in Alzheimer's disease. In the past decade, there have been you know, half a dozen or more multi, multi-million dollar trials of drugs to try and slow down Alzheimer's disease, and they all failed. And then the drug companies looked back and said, you know what, why this has happened is because we basically have no idea what it is we need to do in order to treat this disease. Now in Huntington's disease, because we know what gene causes it, and we've known for 20 years, we know exactly what we need to do. We have to either prevent the effects of the gene or minimise the effects of the gene on our brain cells. And that's, it's as simple as that. It gets a bit more complicated the more you look into it, but that's the basic problem. And that means that any discovery in a mouse or a human or a cell or any other thing, if we can't link it to the gene mutation that causes HD, then we don't need to bother about it. It's not important. We, other diseases really just don't have that, uh, that kind of level of certainty about what is and isn't relevant to their disease. And that give, does give us a huge advantage. The second big uh, reason to have hope, in my opinion, is the nature of the global HD community, which includes got people like you, uh, the, all of the lay associations, and there are dozens of them, um, patients and family members have always been a huge part of the scientific community. And again, this is something that's very different from other um, science communities, if you like. So I've been to a lot, of, a, a lot of conferences where people talk about Alzheimer's research and so on. And there really aren't any patients there at all. No family members, no one affected by the disease. That's simply not true of HD science meetings. Um, you know, if you go to the World Congress on Huntington's, about half the people there will be from HD families who want to hear about what's going on. Um, and that, it's always been like that, even before the gene was discovered. Um, the, the families have always been involved. The associations have always supported research and have always encouraged family members to get involved in research. And that has dramatically accelerated the pace of research because people stay in, involved in research and research involvement is also something that runs in HD families in my experience. So people often do research for themselves, yeah, but for their kids and their nieces and nephews as well. That really speeds things up. We also have a pretty good research infrastructure. So we have lots of things like the European HD network, which brings scientists together from across the world, collaborating rather than competing giving funds and also giving resources, so sharing stem cells and sharing uh, you know, samples of medicines that might work with each other so that we can all speed up our efforts <coughs> to treat HD. Things like HDO, well there isn't anything like HDO, so I just need to highlight that specifically. Uh, Matt and Kat do a f f phenomenal job of telling you about HDO, but from my perspective as a scientist and also as a neurologist, meeting people who are kind of frequently at the very lowest ebb when I tell them the news that's affecting their family. HDO is, is completely unique in any neurodegenerative disease and is a complete paradigm shift in the way that, that Matt, uh, uh, Matt's generation and those that will follow deal with this disease. It's As the slogan goes, it's a, a whole generation taking a stand against Huntington's disease and helping each other um, and help, helping to break down the stigma that Kat mentioned, so it's great. Now, CHDI. Hands up if you've heard of CHDI. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven people in the room. Um, the British government, I checked a few years ago, the British government spends something like two, something like, no, wait, let me get this right, something like 80 million pounds a year on lung cancer research, which is a lot of money. CHDI spends about a hundred million pounds a year on Huntington's disease research. And lung cancer is something like a thousand times more common than HD. So, and it's not just money. So CHDI is this American non-profit drug company, basically. That's the way that I explain it. So it's a drug company like Pfizer or Roche. But it has one goal, which is to find treatments to slow down the progression of Huntington's disease. And it is not for profit. So. It doesn't generate profit, it doesn't have shareholders, it doesn't have to answer to a board of directors or anything like that who are interested in profit. Um, all of its efforts are, are dedicated to finding treatments for Huntington's disease. I'm not sponsored by them, I don't take money from them, I'm mentioning them because they are totally different from anything in any other disease and they're entirely devoted towards Huntington's research. 
and they have been responsible for uh, many of the breakthroughs in the past decade. They will also be critical to the forthcoming trials of drugs intended to slow down HD. So um, now you've all heard of them, uh, look out for their name and uh, be thankful that for whatever reason, the people who donate money to set up CHDI are doing that. Um, you know, I'm sure in our own minds we can imagine why very rich people might want to set up a Huntington's disease drug research charity, and I'll leave it at that. But um, I would say that if any, any approach is going to work for HD, it's going to be that one. So three is the, what I like to call a golden window of opportunity, and this is a particular way of looking at HD and how it works in the body. So if you imagine the life of someone who carries the HD mutation, for a while they'll be fine, and then at some point they'll start to get signs of the disease, and those will gradually increase. What's happening, and we call that symptom onset, what's happening in their head is that from some point before symptom onset, the number of healthy neurons, the number of healthy brain cells is slowly going down. So at, at birth all your neurons are healthy, and then at some point you have less than 100% healthy neurons. <coughs> What we also know from studying animals and people with HD is that for a long time, in fact throughout the life of someone with HD, some of the neurons are not dead, they're struggling, so they're unwell or they're unhappy, but they're not dead. Later on, neurons die, but neurons die in all of our brains, it happens more quickly in HD. But I think the crucial thing is that there are always plenty of neurons that are not dead, but are unwell, and those can be helped. If we can lighten their load a little bit, we've reason to believe that, that, that they can get better and that can make a big difference. So back to the genetic test, you can have that done when you're 18 or older. And what that means is that there's you know, potentially decades, this golden window of opportunity between someone finding out that they have the HD mutation and developing symptoms. All the while, there are all these brain cells that we have the potential to save. So. We, and during this period right now, we can study the brains of people with HD. And when we have drugs, we will be able to test them in the brains of people who have HD. And if they work, we'll be able to give them the drug for years. And what we aim to do is to make life a little bit easier for the neurons. And that will push forward the age of symptom onset. And when, once we do that, which I think will happen, eventually symptom onset will be pushed beyond the age where people will die naturally, and that is basically a cure. Needless to say, we're not there yet. So it will not have escaped your attention that that's, a, that's all about preventing onset. Well, what about people who have symptoms already? Is it too late for them? I believe that it is not too late for people who have symptoms already, and here's why. You can make a mouse how, be born with the HD gene, and then as it gets older, it becomes symptomatic, it becomes slow, and it has problems with thinking and moving, and it's obviously got symptoms very similar to HD. In ways that I will talk about shortly, you can actually switch off the gene in these mice, and that basically takes away the effect of the mutation. And what happens if you do that in the mice is that the mice get better. When, when, the, when this was first carried out, the expectation was that the mice would die more slowly. But actually what happened was that the mice improved, not completely, but they improved. And this goes back to the fact that there are neurons that are not dead, but struggling or unwell. And if you can just lighten the burden a little bit, those neurons do seem to be able to get better. And we've reason to believe that that is also the case in humans. So if we can come out with treatments that will lighten the burden on our brain cells a little bit, we've reason to believe that if, that's test if those are tested in people who already have symptoms, those people will, if we're lucky, we'll get better. So that's what we're working towards. We're not, just, we're not just aiming to test the drugs in people with symptoms so that we can give them to people to prevent symptoms. Of course, we do want to do the second thing, but we also think that the first thing will directly benefit the people that the drugs are given to. My final point's a bit abstract, and it, I have to talk about glaciers, and, and then I have to remember whether to say glaciers or glaciers, and where I am in the world, <laughs> because people laugh at me if I say it the wrong way. Science is cumulative, it builds up like a glacier. So each, each, piece, each individual piece of research is like a single snowflake that falls on top of a glacier. And then over the years it gets compacted down and down. And no single snowflake makes that much of a difference. But over the years it creates this huge thing that can literally move mountains. 
And that's what I think science is like. And even if we have what you would call a negative result, if you have a, a trial that didn't work, that feels like a setback. And there may be, it may be disappointing for the people who run the trial, but actually for our overall efforts to find treatments, that's useful information. We get better at running trials that way, but we also know exactly where to focus our attention. We find out why the drug didn't work. We look into the cells and say, well, ah, the drug wasn't hitting the target properly. Or we say, well, this, this pathway is not going to work at all, so we'll concentrate our attention on something else. So each day we know a bit more than we did yesterday. And some of the cleverest people in the world, and I'm not including myself in that, people way cleverer than me, are working round the clock in laboratories all over the world to come up with treatments for HD. We really, really want to do it. So from now on in my talk, you'll see things that are in green, and those are particularly, particularly for people who've heard me talk before and might be bored of what I've said so far. The things in green are the things that are new in the past couple of months. Uh, and the, well, most of them come from the CHDI Foundation annual meeting in Venice, which was last month. Um, the, uh, there are three research updates from Venice on, at hdbuzz.net that you can click on uh, and find out lots and lots of detail about what went on. But I'm going to give you the, the kind of most exciting news over the next few minutes. So a lot of people ask me, why is it taking so long? Hands up if that's something that you want to know. <laughs> So, 20 years ago the gene was discovered, why don't we have treatments yet? The, the reason is this thing, which is called the drug development pipeline. So, in order to get a drug approved, you have to go through all of these stages. You can't go from an idea to a clinical trial directly. First of all, you have to have the idea, and that means studying the disease, figuring out what's going wrong, and then testing drugs designing drugs or testing existing drugs to see if they do the thing that you think is necessary in order to bring about the improvement that you want to see. That takes a long time. And then you have to test those drugs in model systems of HD. Cells that have the HD gene in a petri dish, uh, worms and flies, mice, rats. Uh, and then later on, we, uh, the most promising things end up being tested in rhesus uh, monkeys because those have brains very similar to humans. Only once those have demonstrated that the drug is likely to work and safe is it okay to go into clinical trials in humans. And at this point, a lot of you may be thinking, well, cut the crap. I'll take anything, right? Unfortunately, what we've learned, thankfully from other diseases, is that that could go badly wrong. So there's an antibiotic called minocycline. Um, which is supposed to increase the rate of recycling garbage in cells, which sounds good. And it was, uh, it's been tested in HD and it's been tested in other degenerative diseases like motor neuron disease. In one trial in motor neuron disease, the drug actually made the disease go more quickly. So people got worse more quickly and the brain, they died more quickly and the trial had to be stopped. And if that was to happen in HD, needless to say that would be terrible. Uh, and you could imagine, you know, something being given to people without symptoms of HD that was actually, it turned out, was actually making them develop symptoms more quickly. That's the precise, the obviously, the precise opposite of what we want to do. And that's why we really have to be sure that we put the right drugs into human trials. The other thing about that is that resources, although we're actually relatively well funded, considering how rare HD is, resources are not limitless. And these trials, human trials, are phenomenally expensive because of all of the safety checks and balances that have to go into them. So we really have to focus um, our, lim our, our limited resources on the drugs that are most likely to work. Uh, and that's what's happening. And, and CHDI plays a big part in that. Once you get into trials, you have to go through three phases. So healthy volunteers have to take the drug to make sure that it doesn't make their brains explode. And then you can go into small safety trials in humans, mostly designed to see whether the drug is accelerating the disease or not. And then come the big trials, and these are the ones that last several years and enrol hundreds of volunteers. Um, and those cost tens of millions of pounds. The whole process, from a target to approval, takes at least 15 years and costs at least a billion dollars. One billion dollars. One billion dollars. <laughs> and probably more than that in both cases, longer and more money. Um, we've had the gene for 20 years. The most promising drug targets only entered this pipeline about 10 years ago. So actually, and they're going to be going into trials in the next year or so. 
So we're doing pretty well. Here comes the science part. So I want to tell you a little bit about how brains work and how cells work. So this is our galaxy. It's what it would look like if you were outside it. And it contains 100,000 million stars, or 10 to the power of 11 for the mathematics geeks in the audience. If you multiply that number by 100, you get the number of cells in the human body, give or take a dozen or so. And in each of those cells, there is this basic structure. You've got the cell, it's filled with this goo called cytoplasm, and then in the middle is the nucleus. This is bringing back your O-level biology, right? The nucleus contains DNA, and this is the recipe book that our cells use to make these things called proteins. And proteins, there are thousands of them, and they all do stuff. So they're kind of like machines. Each one has its own particular job in the cell. Eat one gene is a recipe for one protein. It's a little bit more complicated than that though because instead of going directly from DNA to protein, the cell sort of photocopies the DNA into this thing called RNA, which is like a message molecule. And the RNA is, is then read again and again, and a, this string of building blocks called amino acids is made, and those then curl up into this protein. Are you with me? Yeah. Good. In the case of the Huntington's, the Huntington's disease gene, which is called Huntington, because proteins end in IN, you've got the HD gene, the Huntington gene, the cell produces Huntington RNA, strings together the building blocks, and makes the Huntington protein. I'm guessing you've all heard of CAGs, right? Yeah. Um, Too many of them causes HD. CAG repeat, CAG triplet repeat. So the way cells work is that three letters in your DNA corresponds to one of those building blocks. So TCC corresponds to this one, serine, which we abbreviate with an S. CAG, you'll notice I'm skipping over this because I can't remember what F stands for. <laughs> CAG corresponds to this one, Q, which the full name is glutamine. So it's another one of the building blocks. So you'll sometimes hear Huntington's called a polyglutamine disease or a poly-Q disease, and that's why. The number of CAGs in your HD gene is the number of glutamine that you end up with in your HD protein. So the normal protein looks something like this. So it's got this glutamine bit at the beginning, and then it's got a, a squiggly bit. The mutant one, the glutamine bit's a bit longer and slightly different shape. And that also has knock-on effects for the whole protein. So the whole protein changes shape. And if you're a protein, then changing your shape alters your function. It changes what you do and how you interact with other proteins. And that leads to public enemy number one, which is this thing. You'll see it looks like a mountain, a kind of alien mountain. What this is, is a, a very powerful microscope 3D image of the Huntington protein, the mutant Huntington protein. So when you have too many glutamines, one of the things that happens is that you, it, the protein forms these little blobs, these little yellow blobs. They then line up into these yellow strings, and those then line up into these mountains. We call them aggregates, but they're basically clumps of protein. So this is a kind of a sticky protein, and it messes up, it interacts with all sorts of other proteins. It sticks to them, and it does damaging things. And what you end up with is basically all of the molecular machinery inside our cells gets kind of bunged up and interfered with. And there are actually dozens of different ways in which the mutant protein does this damage, but the bottom line is that that protein is poisonous to our cells. And so that's what we need to do, and that's what we need to focus on. So scientists then kind of break down that problem into possible solutions. And I'm going to tell you about the top five possible solutions that, that are being worked on. And I've organised them into, well, I've chosen them on the basis that they are most exciting and also most likely to lead to human trials soon. These are my top five. Reducing production of the mutant protein, improving communication between brain cells, supporting neurons, helping them to survive, reducing inflammatory toxins and project, protecting the gene switching systems of our cells. So if you've heard of gene silencing, put your hand up. Good. I'm glad because basically if you talk to a hundred HD researchers and ask them what the most exciting approach to treating Huntington's is. 
98 of them will say gene silencing, um, even though many of them will be working themselves on different things. The idea behind gene silencing is that it's a bit like if your house is flooding. You know, at some point, you, because the bath is overflowing or something, at some point you're going to want to grab a mop and tidy up the mess on the floor. But the first priority is turning off the tap, right? And that's what gene silencing does. So we, we come back to this idea of the gene, the message molecule, and the protein. And gene silencing drugs basically act here. They are drugs that look like the Huntington RNA, and they stick to it. But they don't stick to the message molecule corresponding to other genes. So they're, they're basically designer drugs aimed at, that, that aim to stick to this, and then they tell the cell, see, you know, whatever I'm stuck to, don't make a protein from it. Get rid of it. Um, gene silencing was discovered in the late <coughs> 90s. Um, and then it was about 2003 that it was first tested in an HD mouse. Um, and essentially since then, it's gone from strength to strength. Everything so far that we have tested uh, this technology against, the gene silencing has, uh, has come up, you know, roses. So every, every time that it's been a kind of pass or fail test for this, the, it has passed the test. So it's been tested in lots of different animals now, rats and mice. It's now been tested in three different, three different sort of recipes have been tested in monkeys, and it seems to be safe and well tolerated. So um, this, is, this is by far the most exciting uh, treatment. I, it, personally, I believe that this will be the first treatment that slows down the progression of Huntington's disease. Uh, last, about two weeks ago actually, a trial of uh, gene silencing in genetic motor neuron disease, also known as ALS, finished, and that trial uh, that was designed to find out whether that was a safe thing to do, and it turned out that it is safe, and that's a big boost because um, that, that gives drug companies a lot more impetus to put money into similar things in HD. There are at least three different labs right now working on different approaches to gene silencing, um, negotiating with the drug regulators like the FDA to get permission to take their drugs into human trials. And when I say trials in HD patients are coming very soon, uh, I mean you know late this year, early next year. These, these drugs will first be given to volunteers. Uh, you may not have heard of Isis Pharmaceuticals, but you probably have heard of Roche, massive drug company. Uh, Isis Pharmaceuticals is a company that um, develops what many people feel is the, the, well, let's say the most promising of the gene silencing recipes. The thing about Isis, the drug that Isis has, is that it spreads very well throughout the brain. So these are drugs that have to be injected into the nervous system, either at the top end here, or at the bottom end at the base of the spine. And the drug that Isis is working on uh, is one that's injected down here, but it spreads throughout the nervous system in a way that other drugs don't. Um, Roche just spent $32 million buying the rights from Isis to take their drugs into the first human trial. And if that goes well, if that drug doesn't cause people's heads to explode, they will then spend another $360 million taking this drug through into a phase three human trial. That's the, by far the most money that a drug company's ever spent on Huntington's disease, by about 10 times. This is one of the biggest pieces of news that's happened in HD in the past 20 years since the gene was discovered, and it happened last month. <coughs> this is a sign, apart from anything else, that the work that we've been doing, developing the drugs and developing the ways of testing the drugs, um, has been working because companies like Roche don't splash money like that unless they think that the drugs that we give them as a research community are likely to succeed. And Roche, believe me, have the uh, drive and know-how to make these trials work. Uh, if you want to check out that, uh, more information about that, it's hdbuzz.net slash 122. So as I said, there may be a downside, which is that these are this is a serious disease, yeah, you don't need me to tell you that. These are serious drugs that need to be given in serious ways. You're switching off genes in the brain, okay? So you've got to get the drug into the brain. And if you take these drugs as a pill, they'll just, they won't get into the blood, let alone the brain. So the first trials will need to be given either into the base of the spine, 
through a needle. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had a lumbar puncture or an epidural. It's a bit like that, but you basically you inject the drug into the fluid, the spinal fluid that surrounds the spine. Some of the drugs will actually need to be given directly into the brain through this thing called a catheter. And the catheter then connects through this tube to a pump that contains a reservoir of the drug and gradually infuses the drug into the brain. So this is not your average walk in the park, this kind of thing. These are kind of heavy duty treatments. But if it works, it'll definitely be worth it. And a lot of people will, will, will want to know uh, how often that will need to be done. If it's, this, if it's this one, if it's the pump, it'll probably, you'll need one operation to put the tube in and then the reservoir, uh, it, the pump just kind of gradually infuses the drug. And you'll basically just need an injection through the skin every few months to fill the reservoir. And occasionally you may need to change the battery. If it's this one, um, it's, it, this treatment may need to be given once or twice a year, maybe more often, maybe less often. If it needs to be given much more often, they'll do something similar where the drug goes into the spinal fluid but through a pump, so that will make it easier. So that's the sort of thing we're talking about, if the drug works. So that's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly my number one. And then the other four are things that reduce the damaging effects of the gene. And it may be that a combination of these approaches is best. So a bit of gene silencing and then a bit of a top-up from one of these other drugs. But the main thing is that there are lots of shots on goal, as the drug hunters call them. So next then, I need to tell you about synapses or synapses. So uh, this is your brain. You probably know that the... Ooh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay. There we go, we'll go back. Just wanted to move the mouse because it looked ugly. That's what you get. Okay, so you probably know that the electric, that the, the brain cells use electricity to communicate. But there are these little gaps between neighboring brain cells and those are called synapses. This gap here is the synapse. And the signal reaches it electrically and the signal in the second brain cell is also electrical, but the message gets across chemically from one to the other. And the way that the chemical signal in the synapse is turned into an electrical signal is one of the things that goes wrong in HD. So this, we're now zooming in on the second neuron here. The messenger, uh, the signaling molecule here, enters the cell and what basically happens is that this chemical cascade is triggered. So one molecule triggers the production of lots of other molecules. And it's those molecules being in the cell that causes the electrical signal to begin. There are these uh, sort of cleaning up machines called PDE enzymes. So they're enzymes that get rid of these signaling molecules. You knew that was going to happen. <laughs> and it seems that some of these are too active in HD. They're overactive. And that the message of the signaling molecules are being removed too quickly. So the aim of PDE inhibitors is to fix that problem. And here we have another drug giant, Pfizer. There are actually other companies working on PD inhibitors too. So it turns out that number 10 is the one that Pfizer reckons is the, is the one that they can treat that is also going wrong in HD. And if you give this drug to mice, damage to cells is improved and the symptoms of the mice improve. P Pfizer want to do this very systematically because if, it, if, you know, if they're going to spend big money on it, they need to know it's a proper target. And one of the things that was announced last month is that a special kind of brain scan that they've been working on to see whether this is a real target in human patients. That trial finished, and it, and it turns out that there are, as we, as we had hoped, dramatically, differ, dramatically big differences between people with HD and people without in terms of the uh, amount of these enzymes that are in the brain. And that means that Pfizer are now happy that there is a real target there, and they will then go on and spend the money on HD. And their trial is probably going to begin in 2014 in, in Europe uh, and or America. Uh, so that's PDE, improving communication. Next is uh, improving survival of brain cells. So this is, the, this is your brain. The crinkly bit on the outside is called the cortex. And in the middle is this bit called the striatum. It has other names as well. So you might have heard of basal ganglia or chordate. These are the, this deep bit 
in the middle is the bit that's affected really early on and really badly in HD. And it's involved in things like controlling our movements and also things like mood and personality. So it's important stuff. Now there are these chemicals called neurotrophic factors that are produced by the cortex and they nourish the striatum and they have names like BDNF and GDNF. And production of these things is impaired in HD, so there's less of these than there should be. And those molecules are kind of too big to get into the brain, but uh, CHDI and others have had the cool idea of packaging a sort of DNA recipe for those into a virus particle. So this is a virus that can infect brain cells, but you make it harmless, and then you put the instructions for making <coughs> BDNF into the virus, and then you inject the virus into the brain, the virus particles inject their DNA contents into the cell. The cell then produces BDNF of its own, rather than having to rely on this dwindling supply from the cortex. The basal ganglia start to produce BDNF on their own, and hopefully then the functioning of the cell will be improved. So CHDI is one of the uh, organisations that is working on this. The molecules that uh, BDNF lands on are called track receptors and the other approach that's being worked on as well as getting cells to make their own BDNF is to try and activate these track receptors using not BDNF because it's too big but little molecules that do the same thing and it, 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 rather than needing to be injected into the brain it's hoped that these will be able to be packaged into a capsule or into an injection into the blood <coughs> excuse me so that's a kind of two-pronged approach to improving uh, the support for, for brain cells through BDNF, either getting cells to make it themselves through the virus or through these track agonists, and both of those are happening there. So number four is to do with the immune system. Now you know the immune system is the, basically is, in, is part of the blood system and it protects us against infection, but the brain has its own immune system. So the orange stuff in the background here is all of your neurons. And the green blobby bits are cells called <coughs> microglia, which are the, the brain's own immune cells. <coughs> and I need to tell you about these two molecules called quin and kina. So microglia produce one molecule called quinolinic acid, or quin, which is bad, and one called kynurenic acid, or kina, which is? Good. Correct. <laughs> How could you tell? So kina is released and damages neurons. Kynurenic acid can help neurons and overcome some of the effects of quin. Normally, there's more kina than quin. In HD, there's too much quin and not enough kina, so quin ends out on top. And the uh, machine that decides whether there's more of one or the other is called KMO. And it looks like if you can get rid of the KMO, if you can reduce the activity of KMO through drugs called KMO inhibitors, um, you uh, should be able to restore the normal balance and help to protect the brain cells instead of damaging them. So. Uh, there's now, there was a big paper that was published a couple of years ago where a, a KMO inhibitor was given to HD mice and they lived much longer, about 30% longer. Um, CHDI are also working on this and that means that things will happen quickly and will be done <coughs> extremely well. Their drug was announced earlier in the year and it's called CHDI246. It produces the sorts of changes when you look at it in the spinal fluid, when you look at the levels of these chemicals, the changes that you see in spinal fluid are heading in the right direction when the drug is given. So that's good news. And CHDI are now actually in the stage of planning how they would run a human trial. We need to be able to measure the uh, success of the drug in spinal fluid. And we also need to find out whether it's safe and what the right dose is. But that's all happening. And that's an, this 032 is a buzz article about that. So the final one is, 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 more, is a, bit, a bit of a mystery. This is still a good target, but think that, I guess it's an illustration of how science is difficult, uh, but actually know it, every day we know a bit more. So our cells, as we know, go from DNA to RNA to protein. And it turns out that little bits of the mutant Huntington protein can directly interfere with our DNA. And that can cause chaos. It's a bit like an elephant running around in the control room of a nuclear power station it just causes chaos um, there are these things called histones and their job is to protect our DNA from interference and the enzymes that control whether the histones are locked or unlocked are called HDAC enzymes and 
one of the most successful things that's ever been done to a mouse with HD was switching off HDAC4. So if you, if you breed a mouse that doesn't have the HDAC enzyme number 4, basically the mice live a lot longer, even though they have the HD gene. So there's something about the switching on and off of genes and protecting the DNA from interference that's good for these mice. HDAC4, there it is. 4 is the lucky number. Um, and we had an update last month from CHDI, who have a big HDAC4 project. What, we've, what they've produced is a drug that hits the target, but weirdly, it didn't improve the HD mice when they gave them the drug. So this is a mystery. And what it means, I think, is that HDAC... Is, is, it's not that HDAC4 isn't important, <coughs> excuse me, it's that we don't fully understand how HDACs are helping or harming HD. So basically we now have to figure out why that drug, even though it hits the target, doesn't do what we want it to do. The science continues. And in another year we'll have another update from CHDI about why they think that this uh, enzyme is behaving in such a mysterious way. But we, it, none of this changes the fact that that enzyme remains an important uh, target to look at. And this is, a, this is a photo of one of the slides that was presented at, at the CHDI meeting. I have no idea what any of it means. Um, so if you don't either, then you're in good company. If you do, then you should phone them up and ask for a job. <laughs> Basically, the, what struck me about this slide is how far we've come in the past 20 years since the gene was discovered as scientists. Ten years ago, five years ago, you would never have seen a slide like this at an HD meeting because scientists are good at trying to understand diseases, but academic scientists like me are terrible at developing drugs. That's why we have this huge drug industry, drug companies, you know, big pharma companies, whose job is to understand things like warheads and surface pockets and solvents and aromatic linkers and hydroxamic acids. They are the drug hunters. They design and make drugs. You give them, a, we give them a target. They give us a drug. This is the, you know, and in, it, it, it's only since CHDI have been involved that we've actually had this incredibly sort of serious and detailed approach to developing these designer drugs for Huntington's disease. The point of this slide is really just to revisit this idea of the pipeline. The HD pipeline is completely full. We have dozens, hundreds of targets and molecules at this end, and there are dozens that are going through testing now. There are drugs in clinical trials now. <coughs> There are also the ones I've told you about, which will be going into <coughs> clinical trials soon. This is a, uh, you know, it's worth looking back and reflecting that it's 20 years since the gene was discovered. Right now is the time when all of our work, trying to figure out what that gene does, is finally going to be de delivering drugs designed specifically with HD in mind, which we have every reason to believe will be able to at least reduce some of the harmful effects of that gene. So the drugs are coming. It's something that was said uh, a couple of years ago by the chief scientific officer of CHDI. And it, it's really absolutely true. So people often ask me what they can do. Um, how do we make it happen more quickly? What can we do in our everyday lives? And many people take supplements, many people eat blueberries. I think right now, unfortunately, the fact is that there isn't any lesson from science that, that we can firmly give you about what you can do to stave off the effects of the mutation. But we can be pretty sure that something like banging your head against a brick wall for 20 minutes a day is probably bad. And if you drink tons of alcohol or smoke a thousand cigarettes a day, probably bad. So I think the most we can say about people's lifestyles, and there is some science to back this up, is that staying healthy, staying positive, eating well, enjoying your lives. So, you know, you shouldn't eat a thousand tomatoes a day or a million blueberries every day. Um, you know, eat well, stay healthy, do exercise, try not to smoke, don't bang your head against a brick wall. Take supplements if you like. Bear in mind that we can't prove that they will work, but there, you know, some people take them, some people don't. And I think that's the most we can say. That's about your sort of personal chance of uh, living as long as you can. I watched, I've been watching a lot of Game of Thrones recently. I'm, <laughs> I'm only on series one. But the guy who's teaching the little girl to do sword fighting, uh, asks, he, he says, uh, what do we say to death? Not today. <laughs> I feel the same. What about the bigger picture? What can we all do together to uh, make this happen more quickly? So we know why things don't happen as quickly as we would like. 
one of the reasons is that it takes a long time to test the drugs. And one of the reasons that's true is because um, we don't have enough volunteers helping us with our research. So HD Research needs you. This is the same guy who said the drugs are coming. This is his advice to people like you from HD families. Enroll in every single study they're eligible for. There's nothing more precious to a drug hunter than an observation that's made in the patients we want to treat. So it's not just drug trials. It's not just, you know, I mean, you can do this if you like. Wait for the drug trials or wait for the drugs to be licensed. It's only by studying people with and without the HD gene that we get enough information to then go on and run the trials we want to run. So sign up for everything. And I appreciate that I'm standing here preaching this kind of thing. But here in Ireland, there isn't much HD research that you guys can volunteer for. And I know that uh, Dr. Pender is here to tell you that that might be changing. All right? <laughs> I can say that. Um, and that's also something that you can help with. Is that him at the back? <laughs> okay, he's giving me a wave, not the other thing. So I think that that's a safe thing to say. Um, this is a name to look out for. This is a big trial that's already started. Not a trial, but an observational study. So this, the, the, the two main aims of the Enroll HD study are, number one, to understand the disease better. Number two, to come up with a register of people who are available for trials when we need to run them so that we can recruit into those trials precisely the people we need for each trial. Um, it's being run globally through the EuroHD network. So if you visit this website, you can, uh, there's a contact form where you can say, I live in Ireland, please set up more centres in Ireland, set one up in Dublin, this is where I live, or wherever you live. Tell them that you want them to support an HD research centre wherever you live in Ireland. And they will do it. They, uh, the main rate limiting step is enthusiasm from the local communities. And uh, Euro HD network will give money and practical resources. And actually, every time someone enrolls in Enroll HD, the site gets money that can then be used to set up HD clinics, and that, will, that can also contribute towards clinical care. So everyone's a winner, really. OK, I've got one quote, and then I want to show you some photos, and then I'm done. Oh, and by the way, I've got some HD Buzz hats. <laughs> one hat will be given to each person who asks, asks me a question about research. There are five of them. Um, and Matt can't have one. <laughs> so, you're welcome. So the first quote is from an HD affected person called Rebecca Potter, who wrote an article in The Guardian. She said, and I completely endorse this message, there is never a good time to have HD, but this is the best time so far in history. Completely true. The second one, I need to show you some photos. So this is the Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington. I was there for Huntington's disease meeting a couple of months ago. It looks like a mountain with a chunk taken out of it. And on the front of that uh, chunk that's been taken out of the mountain is the statue of Martin Luther King. And on the side of that, it says something that's basically almost exactly what I've been saying for the past hour or so. Out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. So I hope that I have given you a few stones of hope to take away with you, but also maybe a, a hammer and chisel so that you can go away and keep yourself informed and make small stones of hope for yourselves. But I would also encourage you, like Martin Luther King, to be a stone of hope, by which I mean <coughs> stay positive, stay healthy, stay open, talk to each other, get involved in research. And that again. <laughs>